Hello, I'm really glad to join you at this important meeting of the Southern Regional Assembly on Sustainable Mobility. I wish you best of luck today and hope it's really productive in giving you concrete examples of what we can do, how we accelerate delivery of sustainable mobility right across the whole Southern region. I think what we have to do, everything we have to do is centred around the objectives in our national planning framework. That's key. And I was, if I was to summarise them, which I do regularly, down to three key objectives. We need to decarbonise development, we need compact development, and we need better balanced regional development in the country. I want to just speak very briefly as you set off in this meeting today, giving some thoughts on all three. Firstly, on decarbonisation. It's the biggest challenge beyond compare to half our emissions this decade and remove them entirely in the next three. And transport, I think, is probably one of the big, biggest challenge, particularly in areas like haulage or aviation or shipping, but also when it comes down to our own everyday travel. We need to change our ways to a better system, cleaner, which is going to be better for our health in a whole variety of different ways. It requires us, firstly, switching modes, switching away from reliance on the private car towards reliance on public transport and also walking and cycling, active travel. We can do it. We have the right plans in place. It's a matter of actually going out and delivering it now. Delivering the Connecting Ireland bus plan, which the NTA have recently launched, which we see working already in places like Dingle and Leitrim, where we're showing when we provide more regular rural bus transport services, the people respond, demand shoots up. It starts to be a win-win, not just for the transport system, but it helps people get to their health needs, helps in social welfare transport needs, it can help in our education transport system. It's integrating the three in that connecting plan is really important and a real opportunity, I think, which we will fund in the next three years. And I'm thinking these three years, because it's our three years in government now where we have to deliver, that's a key project. Same with the bus next projects in each of our cities. And I think really important there, picking iconic routes, I always pick Limerick as an example, where we could connect University of Limerick, LIT and Mary I College as a way of transforming the city centre, providing connectivity across different parts of the city in an iconic project. Again, we should look to set and deliver in the next three years. But also, active travel is really important. We've just committed another 289 million euros this year. I hope in each of your councils that's going to be put to really good use. And it is going to be there each year. We have to build on experience. We're only warming up and starting on this. And I think it's actually probably the key project because it can be delivered quickly. We're going to amend the road traffic acts to make it easier for councils to use experimental traffic management measures, to take space sometimes cheaply without huge CPOing or big planning permission requirements, without getting stuck in the EIA or all the other me mechanisms that are holding up and delaying projects. And to give councillors power put it back to the councils in the end to say, OK, we'll try it, we'll experiment, put it in for 18 months, and if it works, then keep it. And I think that's going to be a key project for towns and cities right across Ireland. And also greenways. The greenway network is connected to this. It's not a separate, just a leisure or tourism project. In my mind, it's vital that they're built for local needs, to get to school, to get to the shops, to get to work, to build public realm, to build back in our towns in a way that really brings life back into the centre. That's the second objective, compact development. And I think it's encompassed by this concept of the 10-minute town, a 15-minute city. And I know the Southern Regional Assembly have done really good work on this. I think you have a framework you set out some two years ago to help local authorities to start to develop such compact development. We've seen examples of how it can work. We all know the examples of those towns where actually by pro providing a better space in the centre, making it more attractive to walk, creating an urban environment that's really, really uh, attractive and vibrant, that's what's going to bring retailers back. That's what's going to make a, a town attractive for people to come and invest in and live in. And coming out of COVID, there's a real opportunity for this. People will maybe say, well, rather than commuting five days a week into the city, to maybe an office, I could work from home or work in a local hub in the centre of the town, and maybe commute in one day a week. And in that, we bring life back to our towns, formerly commuter towns, starting to have people living and working in the centre. It's important they're living in the centre. 
Governments recognise this. Our living over the shop scheme hasn't worked in the last 20 years. We need to ramp it up. And I know Minister Dara O'Brien is committed to this. We'll be launching our town centre strategy shortly. And it will give local authorities greater flexibility. Let's saying that we don't necessarily need to have planning permission on every occasion if you're going to convert an old shop or underutilised building, a pub or whatever, back into living quarters. We've seen in towns across the country how that can work and want to replicate those best case examples. What will also help, in my mind, is the new zoned land tax. So that land which is lying idle, which is zoned but not been developed, there starts to be pressure on that to say, no, we can't leave gaps in the centre of our towns. We have to develop back in the centre. The advantage of that is we're using existing assets. They're within walking distance of where our schools are, where our churches are, where our shops, pubs and cultural institutions are. That's why it makes sense to bring back and save and really let our, our rural 19th century market towns, in my mind particularly, thrive. We'll help that on the transport side. I've been very clear to TII and others that our roads budget should focus on providing the relief roads and bypass roads that will help take traffic out of the centre of towns. And in that way, make it a more, traffic, a more attractive place to live in, to shop in, to work in, to make our 19th century market towns really thrive. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we need better balanced regional development. It's not happening. Still, 74% of the new housing is in the Eastern Midlands region. I have nothing against that region. I represent Dublin City, but it won't work for this country if everything tips over into the East Coast. We need in particular our regional cities to thrive and to grow. We need in particular Cork, Limerick and Waterford to grow. And I think the way we do that is by investing in those cities, by investing in a metropolitan rail network for Limerick, using the existing four railway lines which are underutilised in the city, putting in new stations which provide transport-led development so that we build around sustainable transport systems. The same in Cork. We've invested the European regional development funding we got in a Cork metropolitan rail system, going from Middleton all the way through to Mallow on the other side, with new stations on the north side of Cork to be the centres of the return to life in the centre of the city. Same in Waterford. We need to move the railway station along the quays to the North Shore and there again make that a centre of development on the other side of the shore. Connect up the greenways to that, put the new br bridge across, pedestrian and active travel bridge and you start to see this virtuous circle where we're seeing that our cities are thriving, they start to grow, that's where our young people can fi find affordable housing and it's, it, it's starting to happen. Like Waterford is attracting jobs at the moment at scale Cork and Limerick, the potential is the same. And I think the more we go sustainable way, that's going to attract further employment because that's what new employers want. They want to be part of a healthy local environment where people find an efficient and effective, clean way of getting to and from work and a place to live in that they can be proud of. I wish you best of luck today. Thank you for this opportunity of saying a few words at the start. And I look forward to hearing the outcome of your deliberations. De Okay, I'd really like to thank the minister for taking the time for sending in his um, his recorded pre-recorded uh, keynote address, and I think it really sets the scene for for the rest of the presentations to come. And um, I think his his identification of three three priorities is very interesting: de decarbonising development, uh, compact development, and of course you mentioned balanced regional development. So I think this is really a good good segue into our our, our next speaker. Um, so I'd like to call on Kevin Lynch. Kevin is the Assistant Director and Senior Planner for the Southern Region Assembly. And Kevin is going to speak to us about the Regional Spatial Economic Strategy and also about the 10-minute city and town concept. So over to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, David. And as you say, the, the, the Minister's speech gave a very good context for what we're doing today. Um, I'd really like to welcome you here today. It, this is a very important event for us. Um, in the regional assembly as part of the implementation of the recess kind of sets the context of um, moving out of the into the implementation implementation phase i suppose it importantly it kind of frames the importance of the contributions from the department of transport national transport authority and tii to achieve the shared goals of, of sustainable mobility in our region and 
the integration and interaction between the national level, the regional level, and the local. And it's also important, I think, to set the context of how the RESIS and the initiatives that we've undertaken in the RESIS kind of build towards a stronger economy and lower carbon future, particularly through uh, 10 minute city and town concepts and, and how these can be achieved. And as I say, um, well, an emphasis today is on collaboration and, uh, and, and, and that's very important. So uh, next slide, please. Just, just a reminder um, of why this is important, and this flows very much from what the minister is, 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 has said, uh, why it's important that we, we progress sustainable mobility. Just on the slide there is a snapshot from the last census, and our region as a whole has a higher private transport use, usage than the state. If we've, um, We've lower public transport usage and lower walking and cycling usage as a means, means of travel to work. So it is, there's a clear issue for us to address. And, um, you know, those, those statistics are, you know, even more salutary when you think of the fact that in our region, we have three of the five cities in the state, uh, Cork, Limerick and Waterford. So we've a lot of positives there, but we've a lot to build on as well. So if we wish to progress as a smart region, as a green region, we need more actions to, to, for implementation here in actions in land use and transport and, and plans to achieve the modal change and how, how we reduce carbon emissions from the transport section. So we, we have a stronger call to action than ever before, as, as well as those facts. There's no uh, statutory and legislative requirement that public bodies must take account of the climate action plan and the new uh, Low Carbon Development Act 2021 in the performance of their functions. Specifically in relation to greenhouse and gas emissions, the Act requires a total reduction of 51% of such emissions over the period to 2030 relative to the baseline of 2018. And it's understood that the transport section will be required to achieve this 51% re reduction in full. So, you know, that frames the, the challenge that, that, that we face. Next slide, please. Well, just to go back to where the starting point for this, um, well, the starting point is the National Planning Framework, but in terms of our work, it's where what's set out in the Regional Spatial Economic Strategy and the Metropolitan Area Strategic Plans for Cork, Limerick, Shannon and Waterford, which came into effect on the 31st of January in, 20, in 2020. They set out a 12-year statutory strategic planning and economic development framework for future economic and spatial development in the southern region in line with the objectives of the, of the National Planning Framework and the National Development Plan. And our collective journey of a 50-50 distribution of growth between the eastern and Midlands region and the southern and northern western regions with 75% of growth to be outside Dublin and its suburbs. Like the, this is core really to the work we're at um, in terms of the southern region and the challenge set out in the MPF of the, of the transition of Ireland. Um, the, the, this, the, this, uh, the, this is central to the work we do. And, and as part of that, the vision set out in the regional spatial economic strategy is for the southern region to become one of Europe's most creative and innovative, livable and greenest regions. Next slide, please. As I say, the primary objective of the RESIS is to implement Project Iron 2040 and um, the, the, the transition of growth from the Eastern Midland region to the Southern region, Northern Western region. And, and I suppose in practical terms, that means that over the next 20 years, there's an additional million population in the state. And for us in the Southern region, that that will require an additional 380,000 people to 2 million in total in the region and a growth of employment by 225,000 to, to 2040. Um, particularly challenging within that is each of our three cities, Cork, Limerick and Waterford, are targeted to grow by 50% growth over this period. Like that's 50% of growth in 20 year period over what they've achieved through all the history. So that's that you know that point frames the challenge that we face. Compact growth will see at least 50% of all new housing developed within existing footprints for our cities. So 
through regeneration and into development, with compact growth targets at 30% for all other settlements. So the Project Iron 2040 is a, is a very radical document when, when you, you delve into it. Like, and we seek to capitalize on that for our region through the, the strengths we have in the region. The strengths are clear if you look at the, the map there. We've got three cities, we've a very strong network of towns and rural areas. So we've a lot going for us. And that feeds into our economic strategy, which aligns with the spatial strategy, supports quality place making for economic growth and an emphasis on the cities. Um, growth of the Atlantic Economic Corridor, the development of the Eastern Economic Corridor, development of our 14 key towns and the network of towns and villages as, as key economic drivers. But look, bringing that all together is uh, transportation and, and connectivity and the efficient and sustainable movement of people and goods between our economic engines along our economic corridors to our strategic port and airport assets and the increased sustainable mobility within and between our settlements is key to enhancing our competitiveness and the lower carbon future set out in Project Iron 2040. So look, it's, it's, it's obvious, but transportation is key to that change. It ties everything together and it brings, it brings that economic and spatial aspect together. So it's fundamental to the work we're doing. Next slide, please. The, 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 the research itself, in an overall sense, in, 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 in the achievement of our objectives, sets out 11 strategic outcomes or st strategy statements. And I suppose the importance of transport to that is that, you know, at least five of those are directly related to transportation. They include low carbon climate resilient society, compact growth, sustainable planned and infrastructure led development, enhanced regional accessibility, and sustainable mobility. So nearly 50% of our overall objectives are, are, are rooted in transportation. And they're cross-cutting, you know, they, they impact on the spatial, on the economic, um, the, our objective for a strong economy, high quality international connectivity, strengthened rural economies and communities, and a healthy region. And these aren't set in stone, things move forward very quickly. Um, as evidence from COVID-19, but also Brexit in the last uh, year or the, the, the transportation movements within our region have changed dramatically through to our port. So, you know, th things change very quickly and we have to be resilient to adapt to that. It's, it's therefore important that growth in our region is transport led and we, we are supporting actions throughout the city and county development plans uh, for metropolitan transport strategies, local transport plans and 15 tenant city and town concepts. So the work we've done in the statutory recess is now flowing through to the city and county development plans and all 10 plans are in progress. And indeed, um, or the first of those, Kilkenny, uh, has been adopted. And interestingly, that that has that is to the fore in uh, the local transport planning side of things. So we are making progress now. Um, so, what we want to do today is through the through the presentations you get follow, following this is is to see how uh, work at the national level is is feeding through now down through the regional and to the local level, and you know the presentations will focus on the work of the transport and top authorities and new policies, framework, toolkits, and and funding streams. Uh, next slide, please. I should say, uh, of course, that we in the southern region, we're, we're not a transportation authority. But I think the key to our role, and as evidenced by events today, is that we have a coordination role uh, between the national and the local level. And we work very closely with the Department of Transport, the NTA, TII, and local authorities on, on implementation of objectives under the region transport strategy that is set out in, in Chapter 6 of the recess. And we're continued collaboration with central government, the OPR for training opportunities, transport authorities, local authorities, and the community and transport and mobility forums uh, is very important. And you know, all those bodies 
um, as we developed the RESIS um, over a two, three year period, they were fundamental to that. Uh, the development of the RESIS in, I suppose, in, in bringing forward the national level under the national planning framework had to give expression to local uh, and, and regional uh, stakeholders. So that was very important to us. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. We also welcome um, the support of the event today from the Office of Planning Regulator, given their statutory training role. And I know, for example, the recent training for elected members in, in conjunction with the AILG, and that, that included a module on transport focusing on the active on active travel. So that working together with the OPR and with other groups is very important to us. I suppose it's 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 important to point that today isn't the, the end of it for us. You know, we're this is part of a process. Uh, of, of, of engagement and um, we hope to collaborate with the OPR, the NTA, TII and others to explore future sub-regional and national seminars with local authorities and these could potentially explore use of area-based transport assessment methodologies, use of transport data tools for evidence-based planning, actions to progress local transport plans and sharing a good practice. And we, we've good precedence in this, and we, 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 we do this a lot in our work. And for example, we, with local authorities, we took, we, and the, the CAROs, we undertook a series uh, of, of workshops on, on climate action to assist the local authorities and city development plan uh, in their preparation. That, that was very successful. And that, you know, performs a model of, of the work we, we are hoping to do now in the transport side. Next slide, please. So on the screen, you see examples of some of the objectives that are in the RESIS in relation to transport. And as I pointed out earlier, they, 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 these are wide ranging related, met, for example, metropolitan area transport strategies, smart mobility. That's a key one for us, in fact, in terms of it's not just about uh, new infrastructure. It's also about changing to, to use new technologies and way of working. So. There's a number of examples there of what, what, what's in the RESIS, and they now are finding their way through to the development plans. And um, they focus on input from all sectors in the, in the preparation of the RESIS and the maps, such as the importance of sustainable mobility. And I suppose that, as David pointed to, um, as we're now at the implementation phase, We've worked together with the European side of the Regional Assembly and ourselves to, to look at good practice approaches uh, in Europe. And we've kind of joined together to do some work on this uh, uh, to, to, to move forward with the implementation side. Uh, next slide, please. So our collabor the collaboration was specifically with the Inter Interreg Europe matchup project. And there, that, the objective of that is to foster low carbon multimodal sustainable transport to reduce air, to reduce air pollution and CO2 emissions. This, this project led to the preparation by Arab transport uh, consultants of the 10 minute town accessibility and framework report in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a 10 minute city or town? Well, the definition we work to is it's a city or neighbourhood that ensures access to a range of community facilities and services in short walking and cycle timeframes from home or access to high quality public transport services connecting people to large scale settlements and locations of higher order services. To be successful that you know really requires principles of compact road sustainable higher densities, multimodal interchanges, and higher levels of permeability for walking and cycling to be to key to making them work. And the, the, the concept can also be supported through five minute neighborhoods, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, etc. I think there's a whole range of, of timescales that we're uh, familiar with. And that can, you know, that can be confusing, but what, what's important really is the principles uh, that underline it, uh, that we're promoting an ecosystem of, ecosystem of accessible and permeable sustainable transport network. 
to enable journeys for key services by sustainable mode. So it's essentially about just putting in place um, a better way of organizing our towns and villages to optimize um, sustainable transport and, and, and sustainable use. Next slide, please. So in preparing the framework, Arif, they piloted a, a mapping exercise of three of our key towns, Arlo, Ennis and Tralee, uh, one in each of the sub-regions of, of the regional assemblies. So case studies were undertaken to assist the proof of, proof of the concept and to show examples of how to map catchments, identify constraints and opportunities for, for improvement. Um, it's a tool that can be used by all local authorities and for other settlements. It, it, its aim is to assist the city and county development plan pro policy preparation and implementation and the concepts can be integrated as part of local transport plan preparation. So it's a first step really in analysing what, what's on the ground and how these can be improved. Um, very importantly, the concept it aligns with other areas for particular climate action and, and importantly, I think for local authorities, the use of the concept is, is useful for applying for funding uh, for active travel and transport uh, projects uh, throughout the settlements in the region and so and, and to encourage transport behavioural change in communities. So that, that report is there and available, it's available on our website um, for, for, for anybody who's interested for, for detail on it. So next slide please. Um, just to kind of get to the summy upside, in, in order to implement our sustainable mobility objectives and the uptake of the 10 minute town framework initiative, um, we've joined today with the Department of Transport, NTA, TIA and the OPR to create this learning event. Progress in these policies, frameworks and add to methodology support, they, these all support our research objectives and they will assist actions in, in the region for sustainable mobility and help us to achieve five, 15, 10 minute city and town concepts. We look forward to learning about progress in other presentations today. We hope all participants take with them enhanced knowledge of progress under this team, which will assist our shared work. We look forward to exploring the potential for follow-up events, and we'll come back to this point at the, at the end under next steps. Next slide, please. So look, th thank you very much. I really hope you uh, enjoy the morning and get a lot out of it. As I say, this is a, a key part of our, our, our journey to bringing uh, the, the transport side of implementation of the research down to the local level and to, uh, to work with people. So thank you very much. To the, the next speaker, if we could please. So look, this is where we're, we're getting in, I suppose, at, at national level. So look, I'm delighted to introduce Garrett Ducey and Garrett um, is Principal Officer in the Public Transport and Investment and Sustainability D Division and Garrett will present on the National Transport Mobility Policy. Garrett, over to you. Yes, thanks David, thanks very much. Uh, and just uh, at the outset, uh, just ex like to express gratitude to the Southern Regional Assembly for organising today's event as, uh, as well. So thanks to, to yourself, to Kevin, Rob and the rest of the team in the Southern Regional Assembly. So, um, as David said, my name is Garrett Ducey, Principal Officer here in the Department of Transport, and uh, I'm currently leading on the development of a new sustainable mobility policy, which effectively is a new active travel and public transport policy uh, for the department uh, and obviously for, for the, the country itself. So this will effectively, this new policy will effectively replace the existing policy frameworks, which many of you will be aware of, uh, smarter travel uh, in, in the area, the general area, and also the national cycle policy framework dating both back to 2009. If we move on to the next slide there, please. Just in terms of today's presentation, I'll, I'll start off with uh, just explaining a little bit in terms of the overarching policy target. We'll work then in uh, many of the existing frameworks you had already heard referenced uh, in previous contributions and just the alignment of this new policy with those. Talk through um, a little then on the stakeholder engagement that's been undertaken uh, thus far and has really uh, very greatly informed the development of the new policy. Then delve into the policy itself a little bit, explain its structure, explain its uh, framework. So we've got um, a vision, principles and goals. 
describe, and this will be, I know, of interest to many, uh, the, the funding streams that are available to ensure implementation of the actual policy, and then just taking today's theme of, of 10-minute towns and 15-minute cities, etc., uh, and the Minister will refer to this himself, transport-led development, just looking at one specific goal uh, in a little bit more detail and exploring the draft actions that are proposed in it, and then concluding on some actual tangible real-life examples of tra transport-led development that are happening uh, at the minute around the country. If we move on then to the next slide, please. So in terms of the overall policy uh, and its overarching target, uh, it, our target, at, our ambition at the end of this policy, uh, which would be 2030, is that we achieve 500,000 additional daily active travel and public transport journeys by 2030. Uh, along with uh, re demand management measures, we would also estimate a reduction in ice car kilometres by about 10%. And cumulatively, that will result in around a 1.4 megaton CO2 uh, reduction. And though that target uh, and the description of, the, uh, of it, that's very much grounded in the Climate Action Plan, which obviously previous speakers would have alluded to. Uh, so this sustainable mobility policy is pretty much the sectoral face to really the, the targets that have been set by go central government uh, to the transport sector and the active travel and public transport uh, elements of that transport sector in particular. If we move on then to the next slide, please. So just in terms of alignment with existing frameworks, uh, obviously the, the, the policy is not being developed in isolation. It, it speaks to both international, EU and national frameworks, and a number of these would have been referenced er earlier on. In terms of our international frameworks, obviously there's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you know, uh, development goal number 11, number 13 of particular importance there uh, in terms of sustainable cities and communities and, and climate action, but also a number of the other goals as well are directly le relevant. There's the Paris Climate Agreement and its successors. Uh, and then there's the recently published EU Sustainable Smart Mobility Strategy, which established 10 flagships uh, across the transport sector, which was including aviation and maritime, so much broader than just the active travel and public transport focus of this particular uh, policy. But of those 10 flagships, there's, there's certainly five uh, which are speak directly really to, to our own uh, policy development. At a national level then, obviously we've got the National Planning Framework, we've got the Climate Action Plan, other complementary um, policies and strategies at government level which we're looking to support, such as Housing for All. Uh, we have the National Investment Framework for Transport in Ireland, which my colleague Tomás and, and Kyle will be speaking about later on as well. Uh, and I also mentioned there's some recent work by the OECD, Transport Strategies for Net Zero Systems by Design. And again, that's a piece of work that we do consider our own policy um, to be very closely aligned with and supportive and complementary to. We might move on then to the next slide, please. So just in terms of how we got here uh, and where we started from, I suppose, um, really working the policy kicked off back in 2018 um, when there was a, a round table held by the then Minister Shane Ross uh, in Dublin's Mansion House, which gathered together, um, I can't quite remember how many stakeholders, but, but there was a large number for a day long event uh, in the Mansion House, uh, in which there was a variety of views and opinions expressed on the future of sustainable mobility uh, in Ireland. And following that uh, round table event, the department developed a series of nine or 10 uh, very detailed background papers covering a whole range of issues and topics in the area and published them toward the end of 2019. And at that time, it was in October, we held a, a further stakeholder engagement event just as we kicked off the public consultation proper on the uh, review of sustainable mobility policy. And that public consultation continued into early 2020. And we received around 250 plus submissions um, as a result of that. And that really informed and guided uh, our consideration of the issues and, and certainly was really useful in the development of the, the policy framework uh, itself. And then last year, uh, we held a no number of bilateral stakeholder meetings with a, a wide range of, of stakeholders, uh, a number of whom there on the screen in front of you including not just you know government departments, regional assemblies, etc., but also advocacy groups such as the Irish Pedestrian Network, Cyclist.ie, the Dublin Commuter Coalition, the Accessibility Council of Committee, uh, etc. So it was a, a really useful exercise building on the, the kind of broader public consultation and stakeholder engagement events, events uh, held previously. And then last year's engagements were really more focused discussions uh, with stakeholders on, on elements of the emerging policy framework uh, and really sense checking uh, our, our kind of direction of travel. So if you move on then to the next slide, please. I suppose another piece uh, of, of the engagement that was really useful in informing our approach to the policy was working with the OECD. 
as they launched uh, and undertook an environmental performance review of Ireland, um, which was published last year, I think it was. So we had asked the OECD through our colleagues in the Department of uh, Environment and Climate Action that the OECD include a specific chapter on sustainable mobility policy um, as a, a kind of special or, or, or additional chapter in that piece of work. And what the OECD concluded as they looked back on smarter travel and its implementation, they made a number of very interesting observations which were really useful to us as we looked to develop the new policy structure. So one, they pointed out, uh, you know, there was a lack of effective implementation. Uh, secondly, they considered that the actions themselves in the previous policy uh, were perhaps underdeveloped or possibly even inappropriate for in terms of the, the, the targets that were being set to be achieved. And they also highlighted the importance of establishing a clear implementation plan, you know, defining a, a clear budget, and also being very clear and um, clear about the responsibilities of the various action owners and setting out who those action owners are uh, and what was expected of them. So that was really useful in, in terms of our own thoughts as to how to approach this new policy. Uh, so what we've done is in terms of the structure of the, the policy document itself, I suppose, we've got a policy statement, which is a 10 year horizon looking out to 2030. So it sets the vision, uh, establishes the three principles, which we'll talk about in a second, the 10 high level goals, those targets we mentioned earlier on, and is looking to set some KPIs then just in terms of measuring our progress towards those overarching targets. And really it's, it's the narrative behind the, the, the overall policy. And then separately, we've got an action plan, which is much tighter, uh, and is simply that, it is an action plan. It is a list of actions, uh, and its time frame is out to 2025. It has approximately 80 actions in them. Uh, it, for each action, there's a timeline, there's an owner, uh, and any supporting actors involved as well are also listed. Uh, and each of those actions then are grouped under the 10 high-level goals. So there's a clear pathway established between uh, the policy vision, the principles, the goals, and then these specific actions, each supporting uh, the various goals as well. So if you move on then to the next slide. So this is the uh, draft policy vision and draft policy framework. And I'm using the word draft there deliberately as we are in the process of going to government uh, at the moment. We've had internal discussion and agreement on it. And we're now, the minister has instructed us to commence formally the, the, uh, the uh, formal process of government approval. So that's underway and we expect to have uh, government approval by March. Uh, but there may be elements of this that may change slightly. However, uh, Broadly, I think it's it's more or less there. So the vision is to connect people in places with sustainable mobility that's safe, green, accessible, and efficient. And then the policy framework, as I mentioned, it's centered around three principles. So we've got safe and green mobility, people-focused mobility, and better integrated mobility. And then under each of those uh, three principles, we have a number of goals, 10 in total. Uh, so if you look at safe and green mobility, we've got obviously uh, to start there, ensure continued mobility safely. Decarbonisation of public transport is coming in number two there, and I know the Minister himself referred to that earlier on, his contribution. Three and four is around expanding availability of sustainable mobility in the metropolitan areas, the five cities, and then in rural regional areas as well. So this is really the actions in this space are, are around about, you know, bus connects in the cities, connecting Ireland in, in rural and regional areas, active travel infrastructure in the major cities and including active travel infrastructure then in the regional growth centres, key towns and villages, etc. as well. Number five is encourage people to choose sustainable mobility over the private car. And this is really around behavioural change and demand management measures. Uh, that's the type of actions that are sitting in that particular one. Moving on to people's focus mobility then, six and seven are really around um, a whole journey approach and inclusive uh, accessibility and also a bit when designing infrastructure according to the universal design principles and enshrining the hierarchy of road users model at a policy level as well. Number eight is really building on the engagement that we've had or look to build on the engagement that we've had in the development of this policy and maintain that level of engagement uh, with both citizens and, and other groups uh, in terms of the promotion of sustainable mobility in the years ahead. And then the, the final principle is, is better integrated mobility. And there's two goals under that, uh, as you can see there on the screen. And number nine is one I'll talk to a little bit further. And number 10 speaks, I think, to Kevin's uh, comment earlier on around smart mobility and, uh, you know, evolving technologies, etc., and the development of appropriate regulation with respect to that as well. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide, please. So importantly, and again, this is taking from a lesson learned from the OECD review of the, the last policy. There is a very clear funding stream established for this policy. 
and what we've done is we've aligned uh, the temporal kind of horizon of this, the, the policy with the National Development Plan as well, which further embeds, I think, really that, that linkage between the NDP funding stream and, and the policy ambition. So transport uh, as a whole secured 35 billion euro out to 2030 under the National Development Plan. And obviously the money uh, related to the implementation of active travel and public transport infrastructure will be derived from that 35 billion euro. Um, so that's very useful uh, and it's a really strong platform to build on in, in terms of the implementation over the years ahead. But of course in, in public transport in particular there's also a need for uh, current um, expenditure to support PSO services in particular uh, and those PSO services are, are managed on an annual basis uh, and that will continue to be managed on an annual basis through the, the normal budgetary process. But to give a flavour, I mean this year uh, alone 538 million euro was allocated to public transport services, the PSO programme in, in 2022 and colleagues are engaged with or will be engaging with um, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform on a review of the PSO programme generally as well. But that gives an indication of the scale of investment uh, I think through the current um, expenditure programme as well. If we move on then to the next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned we just take a, a moment or two just to have a look underneath the bonnet, so to speak, in terms of one of the goals. So this is goal nine, the better integration of land use and transport planning, um, and speaks to an, a number of the contributions made earlier on around the 10-minute town, 15-minute neighbourhood as well. But I wouldn't like to leave the impression that this is just it uh, in terms of this policy and the support it can potentially offer those concepts Obviously, there's a lot of other actions uh, in terms of supporting permeability and active travel um, elsewhere in the in the policy framework, particularly around uh, goals uh, six and seven, um, uh, which also are, I think will be of real use to local authorities across the country in, in terms of uh, better integration of land use and transport planning and also the promotion of the concepts of 10-minute towns, etc. But if we look at goal nine in particular, it's around better integration of land use and transport planning and it has five uh, separate actions in, in here, three of which are, are new or expanded actions. Um, so we've got extending the statutory transport planning remit of the NTA to the other uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, there's a new, an action gone in around ensuring that the reviews of the recesses include an analysis of land use development potential based on accessibility to the proposed core public transport network. Uh, and that concept is coming from, if people are familiar with the review of the GDA transport strategy at the minute, there's um, an interesting section in it, uh, in this space toward the, the end of the document. And that's something we'd like to see uh, rolled out more generally as well. And when we get to the reviews of the recesses. Um, it's been mentioned, I think, already this morning around local transport plans. Uh, so there's a commitment here to, to fund, prepare and commence implementation of, of the local transport plans for the regional growth centres in the key towns, uh, having regard to the area-based uh, transport assessment guidance by the NTA, and I think uh, Owen may speak to that later on in his presentation. Obviously then continuing action is to deliver the actual metropolitan area transport strategies in the cities. We don't just want to develop these strategies, we, we want to see them delivered. And then a complementary action, um, which is coming from one of those other policy frameworks of government that I spoke to earlier on, Housing for All, there's an action in it to establish a working group between ourselves, uh, a number of other agencies, the NTA and the LDA in particular, to consider transport-led development in the major urban centres. Um, and that working group was established just before Christmas, uh, and we're just working up our terms of reference now with a meeting, I think second meeting uh, in a couple of weeks time. If we move on then to the next slide. And while we've been speaking a lot about policy frameworks uh, and high level strategic direction, I, I suppose it's worth just taking a moment to reflect on the ground works that are underway or are about to commence across the country really, which show the potential I think afforded by both these policy frameworks and the funding uh, envelope that is now currently available. So in terms of these examples here, Adamstown is the first one on the screen there. And that is a, a picture there of construction that's underway just around the train station, for those of you who are familiar with Adamstown on the Dublin Cork mainline. Um, Adamstown, the SDZ has been there for many, many of the years, 15 or 16 years now at this stage, which is not a little bit longer. Uh, potential housing development potential of up to around uh, eight and a half, nine thousand units. There's 975 units going in around the station as well as a huge commercial uh, and retail um, development as well. And the funding streams for that are, there's a URDF contribution going in uh, in terms of uh, a new civic plaza and library, I think. And also, of course, the Department of Transport has been funding it. We would have funded the four tracking of the Kildare line uh, back in the mid 2000s. And then there's a huge funding uh, stream going in through the DART Plus program as well to um, extend DART services out to that 
part of the part of the network as well. So that that mix of funding is something that's evident across these other examples as well. If we turn that to Oranmore and Galway, again the funding streams here are a mix of URDF and Department of Transport funding as well. There's a housing potential for 1,100 units, and these housings, these housing developments in all of these locations are very much attuned with that 10-minute town uh, concept described earlier on, where you know, active travel is prioritised for local journeys, but then there's high capacity public transport to bring people in and out of major urban centres as well. So the funding here, it's a mix of URDF funding going to Galway County Council to develop a master plan for that area outlined in red. And then there's actual funding uh, being allocated towards the construction now of uh, an additional platform and track infrastructure at the existing RMR station. And that funding then is also being complemented by funding from ourselves through the NTA, uh, which will see, of course, then you'll see the transport infrastructure go in uh, long in advance of the uh, the housing, the later housing development that we all hope to see there. Colbert and Limerick is another great example, uh, very much one of those key projects that the LDA is leading on in terms of bringing together the various state actors in the area and the various parcels of land, a housing potential for up to 2,800 units, uh, funding from NTA through ourselves through the NTA is being used to redevelop the station itself uh, and the LDA uh, will be finalising and publishing the, the spatial framework for the area sometime in the early part of this year, I, I think it is. The North Keys then on Warford, no doubt there's, there's people on the call familiar with it, just as with, with Limerick as well. Again, funding, a mix of funding here from URDF and Department of Transport through the NTA in terms of the bridge and then URDF in terms of the movement of the, the train station. Uh, and that's, you know, a fantastic regeneration uh, project down in, in Waterford with really um, uh, the potential to really kickstart developments in terms of obviously on the northern side, but also create those new linkages between north and south through the, the Department of Transport NTA funded bridge linking both. And then Cork, again, no doubt there's plenty on the call familiar with the Cork Docklands, uh, which is a massive regeneration project in total um, uh, and uh, has a number of different moving parts, of course, as well. But it, interestingly, its funding, uh, you know, ultimately will be URDF, W Department of Transport funding, and then the Minister himself referred to the fact that we're also using EU Recovery and Resilience Facility funding there in terms of phase one of the Cork Commuter Rail Programme, which uh, is you know hugely integral to the overall plan, particularly the Tivoli site, which is the one in the, in the picture there as well. So that's just a couple of examples of uh, you know progress on the ground across the country as we speak, and also I think shows the um, the potential for the various authorities across the country to maximise funding opportunities through different funding streams that are now available uh, and are there to be utilised. If we move on then to the next slide, please. So then to conclude, um, well where we are. Uh, I mentioned in terms of a new policy, the intention is to publish that policy uh, in Q1. That's a climate action plan target to have it published in Q1. We are very well advanced and working toward that target and we're just commencing the formal government approval process now over the next few weeks. Um, so that I would expect to see um, a new policy published by the end of March. And the interdepartmental working group, that's specifically in relation to the um, transport-led development and the Housing for All action. And as I mentioned, that group has been established just before Christmas, is meeting again, I think very shortly next week or so. Uh, and we're just working on the terms of reference for it. And then as part of the policy, and I mentioned the, the OECD's review earlier on, and one of the criticisms it had of the previous policy and implementation was the lack of effective implementation. So as part of that, we will be looking to establish uh, part of the, the new policies implementation rather. We will, will be looking to establish a, a leadership group uh, to ensure that we really do drive delivery and we think uh, an important part of keeping focus on delivery will be the fact that we split out the actions into a much tighter uh, 2025 horizon uh, which then behoves us all really to go back in in 2020 late 24 early 25 and look back at those actions to see how we've implemented them uh, and effectively put in new actions to ensure that we hit the overall target by 2030. So thanks very much um, for the opportunity again to speak today and uh, happy to take any questions. I'd like to hand over to Aoife, introduce Aoife O'Grady from, from the Department of Transport as well, from the Climate Action and Communications Division. And Aoife is going to talk about the National Transport Demand Management Framework. So Aoife, over to you. Thanks very much, David. And thanks, Gareth. That was the best step, I think, since Keith Earl's last call to try. Um, so look, I'm here today to tell you about demand management, which is the, the kind of the second half um, or the corollary to sustainable mobility policy. Um, you might have seen uh, there was a lot of um, few headlines last November when we published a, a study into demand management of the five cities. Um, so I'm here today to basically tell you what we're planning on doing a demand management 
nationally, regionally and locally, and what the, the future steps are. So could I have next slide, please? Thanks. So look, demand management is one of the four pillars of our transport um, objectives under climate action. We, we've got four main ways that we're going to deliver our 51% goal. So one is sustainable mobility policy that Gareth's just been talking about, um, increasing the blend of renewable but um, biofuels in our petrol and diesel, moving quite a significant proportion of our transport to um, electric modes or, or even zero emission modes. And then lastly, once we've kind of ticked all of those boxes, we've got people onto active travel and public transport, we, we've got people into electric vehicles, we were reducing the pollution from our petrol and diesel because of renewable biofuels, that still leaves us with quite a lot of um, a gap to target on our 51% target for, for carbon emissions reduction. And really the, the, the option we have left is reducing travel demand, and particularly here on the Climate Action Plan, it's reducing the car kilometres driven by ICE, internal combustion engine um, vehicles. Next slide, please. So this slide really just brings us through the key mitigation measures that were included in, in CAP21. So you've got um, on the first uh, row there, it's the electrification of the fleet. So you've got 2025 up to 2030. And you can see there that really the electrification of the fleet will actually bear a the, the biggest degree of burden in um, reducing our emissions um, in by 2030. The second row is, is talking about sustainable renewable fuels, so increasing our biofuels blends. So the ambition is by 2025 we'll have a biofuel blend of 12% um, in diesel, 10% in petrol, and by 2030 hopefully getting to 20% in diesel and 10% in petrol, and that then takes us down another 1.17 megaton. Um, and then the, the third one really is, is combining the sustainable um, travel trips. So we're looking at half a million additional daily sustainable trips per day by 2030. And then the corollary of that is, and at the same time, to reduce our ICE car kilometres now by a minimum of 10%. The maximum 25% is, is really in brackets because that's not our target at the moment. But you'll see on the bottom row, that we are missing um, 0.9 of a megaton of carbon. So one of our actions this year is to undertake a further program of work. We kind of we we think we know what we can deliver through electric vehicles. We know what we can deliver through biofuels. We know what we can deliver through our additional um, daily sustainable travel trips, and with a 10% reduction in ICE car kilometres. With all of that, that gives gives us a gap to target of 0.9 megatons of carbon still left left to find a pathway. And the, the max 25% is if all of that went on to travel demand, you would be looking at taking a 25% of ICE trips, which is obviously a really, really high bar. So I, I don't think that's likely, but it's more to point out that the 10% reduction that we have in CAP21 is not the, the target, it's the minimum amount we need to deliver. It's quite likely that we'll come up with a target later on this year, which is higher than 10%. But that 10% is a floor that we need to achieve, not the ceiling. Next slide, please. So then focusing in on, on demand management, um, what are our actions? The actions we, we did, we've had in the, the 2021 Climate Action Plan that was published earlier this year was um, 250A, to examine the role of demand management measures in Irish cities, including low emission zones and parking pricing policies. And that was the action there was to um, publish the findings of the demand management study, which is the cover here. Five Cities Demand Management Report. It's, it's online. It's um, 170 pages of a riveting read. So recommend you go through that. And then following on from from that first one, which is now done, and these these next two are really over to be delivered um, in part over the next year, but with reporting in both cases by quarter four 2022. So the, the next one is to have, have a consider about, well, what are the national regulatory barriers that there might be to delivering demand management measures? So we will have um, a national government review. Not all of these are on the transport side. A lot are on planning, some on pricing and taxation. Um, so we'll have a, a, a cross-governmental high-level review of the, the regulatory barriers that remain and the work stream and proposals where these can be addressed and removed um, over the coming years. And then the last one is really where today's presentation comes in. Um, and if you think of 2050B as, as thinking about what the national barriers are, 2050 258B 
is really about identifying a local pathway um, at a local level to deliver demand management measures. So some of some of the actions in the five cities report which we published were about national measures, so thinking about um, progressive taxation, delivery of the national planning framework, um, improving and enhancing the, the transport appraisal process, which actually colleagues of ours in the strategic research side will be presenting to you um, shortly on. But that's, that's all work that will be done at a, a national governmental level. And this, the third one here is really about, well, if we're implementing demand, ma demand management measures across the country, what does this look like? What does this look like at the local level, at the regional level? And can we develop a pathway across the regional level in the first instance to, um, to delivering demand management out by 2030? Next slide, please. So the five cities demand management study, as I said, is, is the first one of those. It was published in November. I'm going to just quickly take you through some of the high level findings in that. And then obviously for further information, um, you can refer to the report online. Next slide, please. So the five cities demand management study was, pub was um, actually commissioned in 2019. It came out of the CAP 2019, um, the CAP 2019. And it was uh, a study that was developed not just to look at carbon emissions, but to look at how you could use demand management to achieve four different aims within our urban areas. Managing vehicular congestion, um, there's a huge amount of economic cost of congestion and with increasing year on year in our cities, so that was one aim. Reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from road traffic, so that feeds directly into the Climate Action Plan. Improving the quality of the urban environment. So this is about reallocating road space, not having um, you know, two, three lanes of, of vehicles coming in and out of cities, but actually making our cities more livable. And addressing air quality issues due to vehicular traffic congestion. So again, um, carbon emission, we have very tight um, targets for. We have our 51% demand reduction target um, by 2030. But as well as, as carbon emissions, there's local air quality issues coming out of our vehicles through knocks and socks. And um, improving local air quality will actually have a very significant um, impact on the life and health of our citizens. So that was the fourth of the study objectives. So it was it's, it's a research study, really, and based around how can you use um, travel demand to uh, deliver each of these four objectives in, in the five main cities in Ireland. Next slide, please. So the, the, the approach that was taken was through um, avoid, shift, improve, and then manage. So um, the measures really were, were examined through, through this frame. And if you consider the first one about system efficiency, it's about the planning system, it's about land use and access to services. So a lot of the presentations we've heard, in the things we've, that have been touched on in the earlier presentations, such as the 10 minute city and neighborhood, that would come in the, the system efficiency. Then we have the travel efficiency, which is about actually making the best use of our travel network and travel system. So shifting to more sustainable modes. And again, if, if we have our, our 10 minute um, neighborhoods, then obviously, you know, you don't need a car to get around. You have you have easy access through sustainable um, active travel modes or through high quality public transport to most of the services you need within 10 minutes. So it, it, it follows on directly from that. And then the measures that were included, things like parking controls, pushing mobility management, mobility as a service, um, car clubs, more sustainable transport and public transport incentives. Then the next one is improving the technology in the, in the vehicles that we drive. So this is about actually, you know, we, we've reduced the need to travel. We've um, then shifted some of that travel to public and active travel. Then for the trips that maybe still need to be made by car, um, that we're looking at more efficient and cleaner um, car transport. So we're, we're looking at clean technology, zero emission technologies, and using our planning and our taxation system to incentivize these. And then lastly, even once you've done all that, there will still remain um, polluting vehicles in the fleet. So at that point, that's when we come in with, um, with uh, traffic controls, smart parking, dynamic tolling to actually reduce demand. And I guess if we're thinking about it in carrots and sticks here, the first three are really carrots, I think. It's about improving our systems, um, making sustainable travel modes more attractive, um, improving the, the, the technology of our vehicles. So these are all kind of the positive things. And then um, the last one, when, when all else has failed, 
and we still have um, some congestion and some, some pollution car trips in there, it's about using demand man measures, more stick-like measures to, to take those remaining trips out. Next slide, please. So the, the five city study took this tiered measures approach and it, it I should say it was based on, um, on qualitative assessments through discussions um, with, with local planners and, and local operators within towns and cities and people working in, in, in executives, in councils, and then also quantitative modelling. And, and through all that, they came up the, with the tiered measures approach. So the tier, the tier one were measures that have been examined at our national and individual city level and combined to, to inform these strategic pillars. And where this was possible, they have also been further refined and assessed using the NTA's regional modelling system. Then in tier two, we have two sets of toolkits. One is the national toolkit, so this is the national level measures, which so looking at taxation, looking at the regulatory barriers um, and removing those at a national level and looking at progressive taxation and incentivization of, of better, um, better vehicles. But then tier 2B, which is the city toolkit, is really those demand management measures that can be implemented at a local level. So that's things like reallocation of road space, moving road space across to public transport, walking and cycling, implementing parking controls, um, things like that. So there's there's flexibility across and the two of those um, toolkits combined will make the demand management measures that we, we deliver nationally by 2030. Next slide, please. So the delivery roadmap, and really this, this is just to say that, you know, a demand management, we're at the very start of the journey here. We, we've got um, a really, really good research and modeling report that kind of assesses what's feasible, what will work, well in different cities and um, there's some really useful findings coming out of that and it, it tiers the, the strategic pillars um, 1 to 11. So at the very top we have 15 minute neighbourhoods so actually if we can deliver 10 minute neighbourhoods in the southern assembly region that's fantastic because um, that's even you know going above what, what, what was modelled in the study. Um, so that's a kind of a local national level and then national planning framework delivery management that's obviously a national level these are the avoiding. Then we move to shift. So it's talking about public parking controls, improving our transport appraisal system, um, things like workplace parking levy, and also all of the sustainable travel and road reallocation would come in that. Then we have improving, and we're looking at alternative fuel, alternative fuel vehicle support and taxation in there. And then lastly, the managing. So looking at things like delivering clean air zones or um, air quality zones within our urban centres, and then um, congestion charging. And these are really around the longer term. Congestion charging there, I know, is, is, is short term. That doesn't mean it's going to be implemented very quickly. That means that a feasibility study would be done in the short term to, to see how it could be delivered in places like Dublin and Cork. Next slide, please. So look, that's a kind of a whistle-stop tour around the five cities demand management study, and I guess what we're going to do with it now. So by the end of 2022, as, as flagged earlier, we have two key actions in the CAP. One will be, we'll be leading on a cross-governmental review of the regulatory barriers. And then the second one will be hopefully a partnership approach between ourselves and working with the NTA and the regional assemblies to identify pathways for the implementa implementation of demand management measures. Next slide, please. So then thinking about where we will be um, by the end of by the end of 2022, at this point next year, what will we have and how will we take this forward? We should have, hopefully, a, a regional slash local framework, because I think that this has to be built from the local level upwards um, to develop and implement demand management measures out to 2030. What we're looking for there is really, we have the toolkits from the five cities study, and that's been a very useful study in terms of saying, well, this is what we think these will look like. This is what we think these will deliver. What we now need really to do is, is to get into a, a kind of communication at a regional and local level and have a look. So particularly, say, for the southern region, where you have three of the five cities in there. If these measures are implemented within the cities, there's obviously going to be knock-on impacts on the towns, villages, other conurbations um, around these cities and on um, the interurban roads going in and out across the region. So rather than, say, looking at the three cities in isolation, it's more about developing an approach for the region that implements demand management measures in Waterford, Cork and Limerick, but then also says, well, hang on a minute, what about the other major towns in the region? What do we do here? 
how do we manage our interurban traffic flows? And I, ideally, with, with the modelling support that we will um, have kind of behind you on this, we will be able to do a, a bit more detailed analysis at that regional level to say, well, look, this is what this will look like. This is what um, this mixture of measures implemented at this regional level would 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 deliver by 2030. And I guess the key thing for us from the department is what we need is that each of the regions delivers um, a minimum of a 10% reduction in ICE car kilometres. So we'll need the modelling to do that as well. To say, well, look, the, these are the measures that will be introduced, whether it's parking controls, whether it's sustainable um, mobility and reallocation of road space to this, it's delivering the 10 minute neighborhood maybe across the region so that all of the major towns um, can, can have that uh, around them as a, as a planning goal. And then with that, well, what does that give us? Does that give us an 8% reduction in car kilometers? What else might, need, might we need to get to 10%? Or if we find, say, at the end of 2022, that demand management needs to go above the 10%, maybe to a 15% reduction, what do we need there to implement? And the idea then is that we'll have one of those for each of the regions, and that will give us our pathway to a national delivery of demand management by, by 2030. And further into 2040, but of course, for by 2030, we need to know that we're hitting that cap target. And then separately, we will have um, supporting alongside that, that work stream, we'll have the high level um, study published of what the regulatory barriers are and um, how these will be, how these need to be taken forward. So alongside the, the regional framework for implementation, we'll have a, a work stream at central government level to um, introduce legislation or statutory instruments to remove those regulatory barriers and to enable implementation of demand management measures at local level throughout the country. Next slide, please. I'd now like to introduce uh, Kyle Moore. Kyle is Assistant Principal Officer in the Strategic Research and Analysis Division of the Department of Transport. And Kyle is going to speak to us on the National Transport Investment Framework for Transport in Ireland and the Camel Common Appraisal Framework Update. So over to you, Kyle. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, David. And uh, just to echo what some of my colleagues uh, from the department have already said, um, thank you very much to all the colleagues in the Southern Regional Assembly uh, for organizing what's been a really, really useful um, webinar. And I hope uh, you'll all get a lot out of it. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you today briefly about the National Investment Framework for Transport in Ireland, or as it's commonly referred to, uh, NIFTI. Uh, so next slide, please. So just to talk about, um, give a brief overview of the presentation. First of all, I'll just start off with uh, an overview of what is NIFTI, um, looking at its role, where it sits in the investment decision-making process, then talk a bit more details about how it's actually applied, looking at the investment priorities which it introduces and how these relate to the national strategic outcomes of the national planning framework, uh, and then the modal and intervention hierarchies, which uh, relate to option selection, and then, digging down into these about how this actually uh, works with other documents we have, such as our common appraisal framework um, and a, a specific project-based uh, example uh, to try and kind of illustrate how the framework will work in practice. And then just look at how NIFTI will continue to contribute towards an evidence base so that we continue to build our knowledge in this area. And then finally, look at any questions you might have. Uh, so next slide, please. So firstly, what is NIFTI? So NIFTI is the Department of Transport's high-level strategic framework to support consideration and prioritization investment in the land transport network. So it's part of the government's Project Ireland 2040 vision. So in other words, it aligns with the national planning framework um, and then underneath that, the, the national development plan, which was revised last year. Um, and it's been developed to ensure that transport investment is aligned with the NPF's uh, national strategic outcomes, as well as our other key commitments, which have been already articulated by some of my colleagues this morning, such as our decarbonization commitments in the uh, Climate Action Plan. Next slide, please. So in terms of what is the purpose of NIFTI? So NIFTI updates and replaces our previous uh, land transport investment framework, which was the Strategic Investment Framework for Land Transport, or STILT, which was published in 2015. Um, and so the reason for the need to update this is the investment context has changed considerably since then. Notably, when Stilt was published, uh, was 
immediately after the financial crisis, there was a severe constraint on uh, economic resources. And so really the focus of that framework was on ensuring our maintenance investment uh, and our steady state renewal of our existing transport assets with little scope for new investment at the time. And um, also, because it was in 2015, it predates the publication of the National Planning Framework uh, and, and, and the 2040 documents in uh, 2018. And so essentially what NIFTY does is it brings, uh, it takes account of the new uh, updated transport context uh, and then how it will actually look at implementing and uh, delivering on the National Planning Framework uh, 10 National Strategic Outcomes. But I'll talk about uh, these in a bit more detail in just a moment. So next slide, please. So in terms of where NIFTY sits in the overall investment decision-making process, um, so you can see at the top of this diagram here, we have the Project Ireland 2040 di um, uh, documents, the National Planning Framework, the National Development Plan, and they set out a set of 10 national strategic outcomes. So what essentially NIFTY does is it translates these into a transport investment specific context. So we heard the minister at the, at the outset today talk about these national strategic outcomes and how he could distill these down. So that's essentially what NIFTY is doing. It's distilling these requirements down into some core investment priorities for the transport sector. And I'll talk about these in detail in just a moment. And then they flow down and at the strategic level, they're then to be implemented in a whole series of iterations of uh, transport sectoral policy documents uh, and also metropolitan area transport strategies and regional uh, planning documents such as your own uh, regional spatial economic strategy. Um, and that's at a strategic level. NIFTY also applies uh, at a project level um, and I'll talk about that, as I said, to a work example towards the end of this presentation. So next slide, please. So it's also important to consider here as much as what is the role of NIFTY to look at the considerations that lie outside of NIFTY or that are beyond NIFTY outside of its scope. So firstly, focusing on the green box here on the left. So what is the role of the framework? So as I said, it establishes a set of investment priorities, and these will be key to making sure investment in the transport sector aligns with the goals of the national planning framework. Um, and then future transport and sectoral strategies, and as I said, metropolitan area transport strategies, for example, will ha then have to align with these investment priorities that NIFTY sets out. And then at the individual project level, it sets out uh, in these uh, investment hierarchies, uh, sorry, um, modal and intervention hierarchies, which relate then to the investment priorities as well. And these will have to be implemented at the individual project level when people look at, is uh, an individual project aligned with the NIFTY uh, investment priorities? And how has the option selection process been carried out? Does it align with these hierarchies? But uh, as I said, again, we'll talk about that through a work example at the end. But then it's also looking here, worth looking here at considerations that lie outside of NIFTY. So NIFTY, it's important to state, does not identify specific projects or determine the total amount of transport funding available or decide on its allocation in individual funding areas. Um, these investment decisions will continue to be guided by wider uh, priorities and sectoral strategies. So including things like our climate action plan, which sets our decarbonization commitment, our rural future, and the forthcoming sustainable mobility policy, uh, which uh, Garrett spoke about uh, towards the start of today. And, and then it's also crucial to note that investment decisions will continue to be guided and reflect the priorities of the program for government. So this is things like an annual investment of 360 million in active travel or the two to one uh, ratio of new investment uh, in uh, public transport compared to new roads projects. But again, these are considerations that take place outside NIFTY, these total transport investment decisions. So uh, next slide, please. So I'd spoken already a little bit about the national uh, strategic outcomes uh, of the national planning framework. And the minister also spoke about these uh, a little bit in his introduction. See, here they are here, there's 10 of them in total. And we can see some of these are clearly linked to transport. For example, for sustainable mobility to enhance regional accessibility, it's clear to see they have a clear focus and link to our transport sector. But other ones are also equally uh, importantly related to transport. These are things like strengthening our rural uh, economies and communities, achieving compact urban growth within our uh, towns and cities. And then also crucially, number eight, a transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy and society. And so it won't be possible to achieve these national strategic outcomes without delivering in the transport sector. And so essentially, um, what we've attempted to do through NIFTY is through extensive research, look at 
how we can deliver a set of investment priorities in the transport sector which aligns with and achieves these NSOs. So next slide, please. So having spoken about that, we take these 10 national strategic outcomes and then through a detailed research, which has, to, has began in 2019 and took the form of uh, 14 background papers, which looked at our current transport network and also uh, projections for our future transport network, we, arri we arrived at these uh, four investment, uh, investment priorities. And you can see these are uh, mobility of people and goods in urban areas, protection and renewal investment, enhanced regional and rural connectivity, and decarbonization. And so it's important to note here that these investment priorities have not been ranked because just as achieving the 10 national strategic outcomes will be key to arriving at the overall uh, economy and society we want to live in in 2040, uh, these achieving each one of these investment priorities will be key in getting the transport sector to align with those overall goals. And um, so, for example, a, a large change from SPILT in 2015 was it put a large emphasis on protection and renewal investment. Um, and that's still reflected here. We can see that protection and renewal is still one of the investment priorities. However, it's also recognized that we have to achieve other priorities such as decarbonization in order to arrive at the transport sector that we want. And new projects when they're proposed for investment will have to be seen to align with at least one of these investment priorities. So next slide, please. So in addition to the investment priorities, NIFTY also introduces a set of modal and intervention hierarchies, uh, which are intended to support option development at the individual project level. So we can see here, first of all, we have the modal hierarchy, and this says all else being equal, that we should look to promote uh, and accommodate, encourage, active travel first, so walking and cycling, then look at public transport solutions, and then finally look at ones which are more reliant on private vehicles. Um, and again, these, invest, uh, these modal and intervention hierarchies are intended to be pragmatic um, rather than rigid framework. So for example, it's recognized some transport challenges uh, won't be, uh, some solutions won't be as appropriate to address certain challenges. For example, if you have a, the need to connect to uh, uh, major urban centers, then active travel is unlikely on its own to be able to achieve that need. So it's pragmatic, and it, it, but it does help the option consideration process uh, when you're looking at individual projects. So I'll, I'll talk about that towards the, uh, the end of the presentation. So next slide, please. So then the second hierarchy is an intervention hierarchy. And again, this looks at trying to make sure the investments that we make in the transport sector are the most proportionate to the problem which we've identified. So it essentially says that all else being equal, we should look to maintain existing assets, then to optimize uh, or uh, assets, and make improvements to the existing network. And only then after we've exhausted these other considerations, should we look at providing entirely new infrastructure. And again, this is uh, makes sense from a cost effectiveness point of view, trying to get the most value from our existing assets. And it also makes sense uh, in terms of uh, like the, it aligns also uh, with just a, a sense in terms of uh, uh, trying to, to, to make the best use of, of what we already have. Um, so I'll talk through now in the next slide about what exactly we we're talking about under as examples uh, of interventions under each one of, of these tiers. So the next slide, please. So if we look at maintenance, so again, that's all maintenance, say, for example, on our national road network, it's maintenance spending there. It also looks at, main, uh, at spending for climate resilience measures. If we looked at the optimization, that looks at uh, interventions such as demand management, also park and ride or electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Those would all be examples of how we'd optimize our existing assets. If we look at improvement, these are more targeted improvements of our existing assets. So things such as electrifying our existing rail lines or making targeted road safety improvements to the existing road network. And then finally, new is fairly self-explanatory. This should be the last one considered. And this is entirely new infrastructure. So potentially a new road um, or extending, adding another carriageway to a road, adding another rail, <clears throat> adding another rail line. Um, and again, you can see that it makes sense that we would consider initially uh, improvements or optimizations to our existing network before we consider outright new infrastructure. So next slide, please. So then in terms of how is this all going to be implemented at the individual project level, which I'm sure is what a lot of you will be concerned about today. 
So it's just worth uh, stating at the outset that there is a, a suite of appraisal documents. There's the public spending code, which sets the national um, uh, guidance in terms of uh, making sure projects comply with uh, best practice, provide value for money. And then we have a transport specific guidance provided by the common appraisal framework. Um, and so what essentially NIFTY does is it provides uh, guidance on, uh, it will be implemented through the CAF, through the, uh, an update of the common appraisal framework. Um, and now that's planned for later this year, probably about uh, Q2 later this year. Um, and so in the interim, we also have interim guidance, which will be published very shortly, which will instruct individual local authorities on how exactly they're meant to apply the investment priorities and the modal intervention hierarchies at an individual business case level when they, uh, when they apply for funding. Um, and essentially, uh, it, it, it relates to two, uh, two aspects, strategic alignment, um, which says that a, a business case must demonstrate that it meets at least one of the NIFTY investment priorities to, in order to be approved for funding. And then also uh, in terms of the option selection has to be developed within the framework of the two hierarchies. And as I said, we'll talk about this through a specific example shortly. But again, it's, it's important to note that the hierarchies themselves are principle-based tools rather than strict rules. So we, we, as I said, we note that some projects will require different solutions um, and it won't be a fixed approach. So next slide, please. So as I said, we already have, and, and local authorities or consultants who prepare business cases on their behalf will already be aware of their requirements under the public spending code and of the common appraisal framework. And so it's important to note that NIFTY doesn't introduce a whole raft of new requirements. Rather, it tries to take existing requirements and make them a bit more refined to align with the goals that we're trying to achieve in the transport sector. So you can see the column on the left here is existing requirements um, that uh, a business case or strategic assessment report when it's a, a, a pre, uh, sent in for funding is uh, required to include. And on the right is what NIFTY will require in addition in these individual sections. So for example, on the objectives, the objectives must be seen now to align with one of the NIFTY investment priorities. Uh, on strategic alignment, it must uh, state that the exact purpose and link it back to these objectives and how it's going to interact with the NSOs and the NIFTY investment priorities. And then in the long listing process of options, it's important that when you're considering option development, that we work through the tiers of the hierarchies and consider the most sustainable and most proportionate solution to a, tra a given transport problem first before looking at um, solutions relying, for example, on private car or solutions uh, that uh, require outright new investment. That's not saying that we'd never have these solutions. It's just saying that when we develop options, it's important that we consider all available options for intervention under the hierarchies first. Um, and so then if we go to the next slide. So then looking at how this would exactly apply uh, in practice. So this is just a, a very high level worked example. Um, so it's worth pointing out at the outset, which I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of, that the Department of Transport typically is not a, a, is an approving authority and so wouldn't be developing the business cases themselves. Rather, that would be carried out either by local authorities, consultants on their behalf, or then for larger projects by TII or the NTA. Um, but this is just, as I said, a, an illustrative example. So if we look at here, first of all, what's our problem definition? So the problem that uh, this that this uh, intervention is trying to uh, address is high levels of congestion in a large town due to HGV uh, through traffic to access a nearby port. So if we look at the objective, so one of the objectives of this scheme, or a key one, is to reduce congestion levels in the town and associated greenhouse gas emissions. And we can see straight away that that relates to two key nifty investment priorities, which can be set out in the strategic alignment uh, section of the business case, which is decarbonization. So clearly uh, we want to remove HGV traffic to encourage active travel and to encourage more sustainable mobility. So we can relate that back to decarbonization. Also mo mobility of uh, people and goods in urban areas. So reduction, uh, reduction in congestion will also support this aim. So then if we work through the two hierarchies, so we look first of all at the modal hierarchy, we look at active travel first. So we can say that um, active travel may help address some uh, congestion issues. For example, new cycling or walking infrastructure might help in that regard, but it won't remove HGV traffic. And in fact, HGV traffic continuing to access through the center of the town will present a danger to those using active travel. So we can say it probably isn't the primary solution here. Then moving on to public tra tra transport, we have a similar problem. It may address some of the congestion issues, but fundamentally HGVs will still be coming through the center of the town. 
So then we would then move down to private vehicles. So we have to look at potentially solutions which are more reliant on this space. Then moving over to the intervention hierarchy, we say that through ma maintenance, uh, can just use not an issue of a lack of maintenance, so we can quickly move down. Optimization, demand side uh, measures and congestion charging may play a role here and may help. But again, the, this is high strategic value traffic. So it's not that we want to stop the HGVs making these journeys. It's just that we don't want them making through the urban center. Uh, improvements, uh, target improvements to the existing infrastructure are limited by the town footprint. So, for example, uh, we, we can't widen the roads any further because uh, of, of geographic constraints. And so then we might look at new, so scope for new limited uh, infrastructure around the town to move HGV traffic. And so working through this, what the solution that we might arrive at or one potential option that we might look to uh, pursue here is uh, a targeted bypass of the town, which diverts HG traffic around it, and then uh, facilitates active travel investment within the town center, which also uh, facilitates compact urban growth. So you can see here um, how this would work in practice. Every business case will be a little bit different, have its own particularities, but this is how you might look in practice to implement the nifty modal and intervention hierarchies. As I said, we will publish uh, guidance very shortly, uh, interim guidance before the common appraisal framework is updated about exactly how uh, sponsoring agencies, those submitting projects, are intended to apply um, these, uh, these different tools. So next slide, please. And then finally, just to note, uh, as I said, NIFTY was already ex uh, supported by an extensive evidence base of 14 background papers, and will continue to carry out this research. Um, so NIFTY commits to nine priority policy uh, areas for further action and further development, and these include areas around supporting um, analysis on our uh, de decarbonization commitments. So, for example, looking at what's required in our electric vehicle infrastructure, urban congestion in our cities, um, the role of uh, uh, rail for freight and tra passenger transport, and protection of renewable key uh, infrastructure. And so, continuing to build this evidence base will make sure that our transport investment decisions continue to be guided by the latest evidence in this in the area. All right. So, next slide, please. All right, so that uh, that's a, just a very quick overview of Nifty. And um, thanks very much. Give a visual representation of all of the, I suppose, the policies, the toolkits, the frameworks that um, that effectively influence or uh, support the implementation of um, sustainable mobility actions at at the local level, where 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 the rubber hits the road effectively in terms of trying to implement this at local level. Um, this morning, Garrett spoke about the new national sustainable mobility policy framework that's coming down the track. Obviously, we, we welcome and look forward to the publication of this. We support the target of 500,000 additional daily active travel and public transport journeys, um, which is set out in the, in the policy by, by 2030. Um, the goals of the new policy for a safe, green, people-focused and integrated mobility aligned very well with the national planning framework, with the regional space and economic strategies, and with the city and county development, development plans, which are under implementation. Um, obviously, we welcome the strength and central government support and funding streams to assist achieving these outcomes for all parts of the, of the southern region. Um, in EFA's presentation, and we see an increasing focus on national, regional and local transport demand management as a key mit mitigation for lower carbon emissions under the Climate Action Plan. Informed by the five city study, innovative approaches are supported by central government to avoid, shift, improve and better manage private transport demand. The rollout of regional and local iterations of the demand management framework to enable local level actions will be fully supported by the department. Kyle then encourage us to see the evolution of NIFTY in aligning um, investment decision making with implementing the priorities of the MPF and the regional spatial economic strategy. We welcome the investment priorities that will address um, protection and renewal of our transport infrastructure, decarbonisation, enhanced regional co connectivity, enhanced rural connectivity and greater urban mobility for people and goods. I think the updates today on progress with the common appraisal frameworks which will aid project level implementation is also very welcome. From Owen and Tara, then we support the NTA and TII's initiative to improve land use and transport planning integration at the local level through using the area-based transport framework to advance the preparation and implementation of local transport plans is a requirement under regional strategy. And we cannot stress enough the importance to use APTA 
and an advanced local transport planning preparation across all our local authorities. Local transport plans will identify investment priorities and achieve multiple pos positive outcomes for infrastructure like growth, placemaking, economic investment, and a better quality of life for all. Finally then, earlier this morning, Kevin, from Kevin's presentation, we see the, the high level ambition that's set out in the regional spatial economic strategy for greener future growth through the recess. The Assembly supports capital investment into our region for strengthened regional connectivity and low carbon mobility. We want to achieve the multiple benefits of the 10 or 15 minute city and towns across the region. We're using EU project partnerships and with other regions across Europe, such as Interreg Matchup, to share good practices. We fully support local authority initiatives to achieve these concepts and enact our 10 minute framework across the region. So what are our next steps? I suppose a very important next step for us in the region is to build on the updates and the learnings from today to encourage greater momentum in sustainable transport planning and project delivery. We hope to continue this dialogue and receive more insights and updates from local authorities on, on progress. Funding has been touched on quite regularly across all of the interventions today. So in the regional assembly, we will continue to advocate for greater levels of regional funding and investment. We will continue to, to coordinate with the Department of Transport, with the transport authorities, to seek the implementation of the region's priorities under a uh, regional spatial economic strategy and support funding streams for local authorities to advance this. As mentioned earlier, we will explore the potential for a series of sub-regional seminars in the region in coordination with our colleagues in the department, with the OPR, with TII, to push progress in local transport plan preparation and to use the APTEP methodology and share good practices in project implementation by the local authorities. We will also use this sub-regional seminars maybe to try and address a number of questions that, didn't, that did, we didn't get a chance to, um, to advance today. Um, and we can use that, that mechanism or we can try and get back to um, two delegates with some of the answers in, in, in the meantime as well. Maybe just to say also that um, in the regional assembly, we're the managing authority for the European Regional Development Fund um, for, for the next funding period. We're working with our colleagues in the Eastern and Midland region in the development of um, the next iteration of the regional program. I think the themes of today's seminar um, align very strongly with that, um, in particular around some of the high level goals of cohesion policy, particularly around um, smarter, more competitive regions um, in, in our regions and sustainable and integrated ur urban development. And this all aligns very strongly with the, the, the whole concept of better place making, more attractive uh, places to improve our economic competitiveness, and obviously sustainable mobility actions are, are hugely in, in, important in that regard. So finally, just to say, look, we're obviously very grateful to Minister Ryan for um, the opening address this morning. A huge uh, gratitude to all our speakers today who've really given a lot of their time and um, imparted a huge amount of, um, I think, very important and, and, and valuable uh, information. We'd also like to thank um, the OPR for their support for this, this, this event. Um, and obviously to thank all of the staff in the Regional Assembly for working behind, behind the scenes in, in pulling this together. And of course, Catherine and Alice for ensuring that all of the, the technicalities of the event um, went well today. I'd like to thank the audience and stakeholders who attended the event in such high numbers. And we really had high numbers who, who stayed right throughout the, um, right throughout the event. We know you've taken time out of your busy schedules, but we think that um, this, this has been really important. Um, we will be in touch with each local authority to arrange a more localised or sub-regional event um, over, over the coming uh, period, and also to try and, and address some of the questions um, which came forward today. We look forward to continued support in these teams. Copies of all of the presentations from today will be made available in a handout in the control panel section so again if you click on the little orange arrow you will see that um, or if you can't access it there we will try and circulate them to anyone who can't get access to it so look again just to thank everyone for their participation and attendance